All right, ladies and gentlemen, now on the Duke by the River guest line to help us preview our midweek match against FC Dallas, please welcome from the thirddegree.net, Mr. Buzz Carrick. Buzz, how you doing? Welcome on the show. Thanks for coming on in. Oh, good. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. Buzz, uh, we obviously uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a big matchup between both these sides. And so we're, we're excited to get to it. But before we get into that, Buzz, as we always like to, we like to get to know who is coming on. And so tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about thirddegree.net. OK, um, I work in um, sports television uh, for my primary career. I long ago thought that there was a coming convergence in television and the Internet. So uh, as an effort to teach myself something about the Internet, I created a a website um, in October of 1997 about the Dallas Burn, Uh, hence the name Third Degree. That makes a little sense when you think back to the Dallas Burn era. So this is the 25th season we've been covering uh, FC Dallas. Uh, And in my particular case, my schedule is not a nine to five sort of schedule for because of what I do. So I have the freedom to go to practice uh, and watch training. And and I have, uh, you know, once or once every week or once every other week, perhaps for 25 years now. And so I um, have covered the team. And over the years, I've had a great number of people come and go that helped me. And a couple of them have been with me for a long time now. And I get photographers that want to help out. And uh, about four years ago, we, um, we had been with the Dallas Morning News for about 10 years, which is the big newspaper here in town and uh behind a paywall and they weren't compensating us it was just a exchange so i decided to uh go with the bet on yourself method and created a patreon service uh created a podcast took my blog back independent we had mostly been independent for the from the early days um and and continue to do what we do so now we're independent now we have patreons now we have an, an an advertiser on our podcast so uh things are going well and we're in our 25th season covering the team Buzz, like quite literally, you were ahead of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think so. Well, there are a lot of people that did similar things back in the early days, okay. early, early days. I mean, no one covered the team. One of the reasons I chose covering the Dallas Burn was because nobody covered them. Um, and there were other teams on the a network called Match Night, for example, that was it was like SB Nation, but maybe way back, way back when. Some of those guys have come and gone, but some of them, you know, you still see around certain places, you know, you'd like uh, Mark Frisket has covered the Red Bulls for decades now and and. There, there are other people that do similar things, but because I'm in professional media and other people that work with me are also in professional media, there's some people that are on radio here in town or work on internet stuff in their careers. You know, we run a very professional ship and a very professional house and we've never, we've never needed it to make money. So we've managed to survive when other people come and go. So we've been here for a long, long time. And, and um, I think in the Dallas area, we're pretty well regarded. And I think, on the national scene, people know what we do is very targeted, very specific on FC Dallas. So in that light, we usually hear people, somebody will come look to for information about the team. That is, But we just cool, try and be consistent and professional. And, and I think we've done a good job with that. Yeah, that for sure. I, I, I called upon your podcast through the YouTube site. So I think you guys are definitely doing a good job there and keep it up, man. That's that's pretty Thank awesome. You. Since 1997, that is. Yeah. I wish we were around since 1997 <laughs> as a yeah. guys, but it's a part of the league. I'm sure you've seen it all. You've seen it all with this league here. Um, But to that point, Buzz, so it's part of the points I wanted to talk about here today. The old Dallas Burn logo, Buzz. Yeah, yeah. So I do have to ask, Buzz, do you miss this? Do you miss this whole look? Uh, No, I I miss the red and black. I would have liked to have kept red and black, but I think it was pretty clear that the Burn was not a particularly strong brand or well-constructed brand back in that era of time. When you tell people that you covered soccer, you would almost always get an answer. Oh, the sidekicks. (laughs) <laughs> Dallas sidekicks were a pretty big brand, won a couple of championships. I mean, they're still around today, but okay. you know, I don't know that FC Dallas is a stronger brand than the Dallas bird. And maybe it's not the choice I would have made, but you know, at least it's, as I said at the time, yeah, look, there's some clubs all over the world called FC, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. So a hundred years from now, it's perfectly fine. You know, it's better than the Dallas Burn, probably. <laughs> I, I will say this as an MLS neutralist here. Uh, I do miss the FC Dallas, uh, the horizontal stripes you guys had, like break, the Breck Shade days I always refer sure to. Hoops, sure, yeah. Yes. I, I, did, I did like those, and I think that was a good look. And I would I would say I would prefer, I would like for you guys to get back to that. But, hey, that's just me as an outsider. Yeah, we, we uh, have hammered them about the inconsistency of their branding because your jersey look is a part of your branding. You, know, you can have a branding with the pattern. You can have it be on the the color palettes of your, like Manchester United with the shirt, shorts, and socks are different, or Chelsea's mm-hmm. got the different colored socks thing that they do. You know, once they picked hoops, you know, stick with that. 
uh, some people like to blame you because I actually wrote an article about how they should pick hoops as their brand as they could build on that. But then they picked red and white, which wasn't great. And they ended up giving up on it. And now I think thankfully now they've brought it back at least as sort of tributary kind of way that kind of carrying it forward a little bit. So there's a little bit of that consistency, but still overall, not, not a good consistency. Absolutely. And, and to the point of the club, um, you know, one thing I always like to ask, you know, people cover this league in different markets Obviously, we're a brand new league, and obviously soccer has a little bit of stigma here in this country. How has FC Dallas been able to stay relevant? And obviously, I know that Dallas is, is Cowboys Nation. So how has the FC Dallas been able to stay relevant, especially in Frisco too, man? I think you can make a case that they're not relevant that in this market. I, I give the Hunts a lot of credit for saving this franchise. This franchise was going to be folded when Miami and Tampa folded. It was going to be Dallas instead of, I believe, Tampa. And the hunts came in and said, we'll take Dallas. And they saved FC Dallas. And then everybody knows the story about how there was a moment where the league was going to fold. And that was all part of that. So the hunts deserve some credit for that. Then you also have to be legitimately analytical and say, most people in this town still don't really know who FC Dallas is. Again, if you're wearing an FC Dallas piece of merchandise around town, people will say, oh, does your son play for that youth club? People know it as the youth club. I've literally been standing on the fields out there and have someone say, you know, yes, no, FC Dallas is a pro team. Oh, where do they play? In the giant stadium right there. Oh, that's a soccer state. Yes. I mean, granted, not everybody, but I literally have had that conversation. You know, you still to this day have people ask you about the burn or about the sidekicks, you know? So listen, since, and I will give some credit to Austin FC here, since Austin FC has come in and done what they've done in Texas, yeah. there's been a sea change at this organization and the Dynamo, Dynamo 2, in terms of the owner. They have this year, they have vastly changed their spin. You can see it in the player moves they made, but you can see it in every phase of the organization. And traction is starting to kick in a little bit, and the stands are, standings are going down, standing, excuse me, attendance is starting to go up some. We are seeing some remarkable changes. Is it there yet? Is it is it 60,000 people in Atlanta? Is it LAFC and what they're doing? Is it Seattle? No, not is it, is it in Portland. No, not by a long shot. But compared to where we've been for the last 20 years of the hunts, they have recognized the deficiency and they're fixing it and altering it. And so I'm optimistic now that they will begin to be relevant in this community. I mean, it's 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 definitely tough. I, I mean, especially like for you guys have been fluctuating so much. It's definitely tough to stay uh, relevant. I mean, for us here in Philly, I mean, I mean, as you know, it's, it's this is another big football town as well. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, besides, it's always Eagles three sixty five. Then whoever else is winning, and it's always been tough for us to kind of be relevant. But now we're kind of the top dog now. Like we're pro- we're more like we're like the best, most successful cl- our team in Philadelphia. So it's definitely been helping. But another point that I wanted to kind of steer towards, you know, it's been no secret that you know our clubs, the Union and FC Dallas, have been youth academy central as they alluded to with with that fan but how how do you feel personally about that whole stigma and just because you guys have been selling a lot of key pieces over to europe and and how how has that been reflected towards the fan base as well well if you're going to be a team uh that is not going to spend money like the lfc's or the seattle's or the atlanta's do then you have to find a way to be competitive and the teams that have um, taken advantage of their academies, Philadelphia is absolutely one of those teams. So is FC Dallas. I would say RSL probably also is. New York to a great extent. I mean, both of the New York teams really also have done that. But Red Bull perhaps greater in historically, but maybe not quite as much recently. But those clubs have used the uh, academy to bolster their most of their teams. So if, if we all know that the draft is a declining value, there's still some top of it there. But for the most part, you cannot build your organization with draft. And I will point to the Dynamo as a perfect example of a team like Dallas that doesn't spend, but is not mined to their academy. The difference between Dallas and Houston in every way, the only difference is that Dallas has four or five guys who can start and fill up the bulk of their roster that are from the academy and Houston does not. Right. So if you have, that's the thing about Dallas is they've only missed the playoffs, I think eight times. They've done that consistently because this ability to use the academy. Yes sell players for make money, but they still got five or six guys at the core of their team that are keeping them consistently in the playoffs year after year and keeping them consistently a relatively winning team. They're in the top five or so of all time wins in the league, grand their original team, but they're consistently decent even without ever winning anything. And it's because of the Academy. Now we want to be critical of the hunts because they don't spend until recently 9 million for Velasco is pretty exciting. 
the big pay for Ariel is pretty exciting. Again, sea change is happening here, but it's the academy that's made this team an above average team, even though they've never been able to push up for a chance to win a championship. I, it's one thing you know I always get into Muni because they they want to spend big money, right? They want to spend big money on big DB players from Europe, and but the thing is, is that. If you can find those general those pieces to build a championship caliber team within your own area, within your own youth academy, who know your system very well, I think that's a win. I mean, like the way you guys have been able. I mean, look at Jesus Ferreira, which we'll get to in a little bit as well. But I, I think it's pretty dope, and it's definitely like you said, it's an avenue of how to build a good team. Um, let's move forward here. Let's talk about the actual the play on the pitch. I want to talk. What has been the style of FC Dallas for the Union fans who don't watch Dallas very often? Well, this year's a change. New coach. He's adapted the system uh, partially, I think, and because of the heat here. But probably for the most part, uh, the system he's playing is basically a clone of the U.S. men's national team. So if you know the 4-3-3 that the national team plays, the Dallas plays the same system. They have the same people, same kinds of players in the same roles. You can expect exactly the same kind of functionality from the team. On the road, that tends to be a mid to low block with a, I'm not going to call it a counterattack, but an, a sense of urgency getting forward. They're not going to possess just to possess. They're going to get forward quickly with some acceleration, play some combinations and try and get forward. Now at home, not quite the mid to low block, and plus they get up three or four goals, more of a more of like you see the national team play when they play these CONCACAF teams where they do want to out-possess you, but they're not going to dilly-dally the ball around. Again, they're going to get forward with some verticality. You're looking at that double eight look, which has the guys like the Weston McKinney's coming out of midfield, the Moose is coming out of midfield, the national team, same setup. Uh, Sebastian Legett, brand new signing, is the going to be the most active of that. Paxton Pomico also does that. We might see a slight change with that now that uh, Paxton and Legett might be playing together. Paxton's been hurt for two weeks since Legett came, so we haven't quite seen it yet. So you can, uh, if you if you know anything about how the national team plays, expect that out of FC Dallas. Okay. Well, I I'll be honest, Buzz. I'm not much of an U.S. Men's National Team, Colombia all the way. But okay. <laughs> but, but for our listeners, they definitely understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, I I did see uh, Nico Stevis being the, appointed the new manager for FC Dallas. What has been the difference? Because obviously, you guys have had success here. I mean, you guys are in third place of a very you know I would mm -hmm. say tough Western Conference. So what has he been implementing that's been a big difference that this club hasn't had in the past? Uh, the biggest thing is that the club showed a willingness to go get assets that he wanted. Uh, you could start with Paul Areola, who brought in uh, knowledge of the system he was going to play from the national team, brought in a leadership aspect because he's bilingual and can bridge the gaps in the locker rooms. Um, they went out and got Velasco and spent some money that they never spent before. They traded um, Marco for Marco Farfan. They traded Ryan Hollingshead, who was arguably the best offensive outside back in the league. They traded them for a defensive minded outside back on the left side. So the number one priority was to solidify the defense. They made a trade on the left. They added a goalkeeper. That's about it, really, in terms of the defense. That was enough with the system change to change things. And then the other thing that they adapted was the style of play. Under Lucci, we had this phrase we used to call called Lucci ball, where possession existed for possession's sake. Now they're not so worried about possession. If you want to have the ball for a big stretch of time, that's fine. We'll sit back and we'll reserve our energy and then we'll turn you over and we'll go. So they're capable of scoring goals in three phases. One, they will occasionally high press, turn you over and get a mistake and go. They will also try and do a build from possession. If you're going to let them have the ball uncontested. And of course they also try and get some activity from set, set pieces. Now Dallas is relatively short, but Matt Hedges is pretty good in the air and Martinez is pretty good in the air. So they do try and get you a little bit on the set plays or on free kicks where you see Velasco's got a couple of goals on free kicks uh, this year. And Jesus has one on a free kick this year. So those are the three ways they try and get at you. And mostly they try and solidify that defense and play a solid tight. It's a four, three, three, but you know how that compresses. It compresses back into a fourth with three guys in front or even more into a five guys in front. If the wings come back, typical to fluid tactics forward, four, three, three compressing back into a defensive shell. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that on Saturday or on Wednesday. I'm sorry. Um, all right. So I want to talk a little bit about the form as of late. Uh, you guys mm -hmm. have had two wins, a draw and two losses, and you're coming off of a big win. Uh, I mean, against San Jose, <laughs> no disrespect to any Quakes fans out there. Um, but what kind of went down on uh, last Saturday? It's a big 4-1 win at home. 
Yeah, well, they took advantage of a team that is not in great shape. We we talk a lot about here that Dallas is, I think, one of the youngest teams in the league. I think maybe the second or third youngest team in the league. So a lot of times they're still learning how to do things. And one of the things we've talked about lately is uh, beating who you're supposed to beat, putting away teams you're supposed to put away. When you have a team like San Jose come in, who had done a little bit better of late, but they still were 13th in the standings. And if you're the third place team, you need to throttle that team. And they did. They, they've got an effective early goal with their, as we talked about, they, they get forward quickly. They exploit mistakes. And then, of course, San Jose is trying to get back in it, leave themselves a little exposed. And in this game versus the game the week before, when they had opportunities to get it done on the road and didn't, and they lamented that uh, failed chance to put the game away in the first half, this time at home, they were able to do that. So this team all year, we've talked a lot about efficiency of scoring here. It's not a high shot volume team. It's a team that likes to work the ball into a good position in the box before they're really getting their shots off. So their goals to shots on goal ratio and their shots on goal to shots total ratio is pretty good, pretty efficient. And so when they play in that efficient manner, they're able to win the games. Okay. All right. Um, I want to talk about a couple of players here. Um, sure. Number one, I want to talk about Jesus Ferreira. Um, you know, obviously David Ferreira, one of my favorites. Uh, I, I like I may not be always in on in tune of what's going on with the USMNT, but I do hear what's what's going on. I do hear you know some just conflicting stuff with Jesus Ferreira. Uh, for you, like you know, as far as future with national team and his future career, what does it look like here with Jesus Ferreira, and what has been the consensus with the fan base towards him? Well, short term, uh, obviously he's a Columbia guy. He has elbow for the national team, by the way. Um, short term, he I think he's content to be here. Now he just signed this new. Uh, DP deal. And he's the first player in the league. Who's a DP from the Academy that he came out of. Yeah. Which is huge. So again, that shows Dallas is understanding that if you're going to make a bet on a DP, you're betting on the DP that, you know, and you know who he is, you know, how he fits your system. You go outside the league on a DP, there's a higher risk reward perhaps there versus the value of the guy, you know, and that can be true of any level of contract and they're doing it with a DP. He's a young DP, which is even better on your cap. Uh, Jesus is a uh, what most people will call a false nine. Our coach adamantly called him a build nine instead of a false nine because he checks back and gets between the lines and helps create forward. And then, like all false nines, exploits the gap. Dallas will exploits the gaps from the both wings and from the eights that are created by Jesus and by his movement. Now, he's at his best as a goal scorer when he doesn't hesitate, when he doesn't think about it. Quick shots, maybe one touch quick shots. That's his best ability his best finishing and it's when he gets into the box and he gets those opportunities we want to see him exploit those quick darting runs same is true with the national team he's not going to post up for you that's ricardo pepe he's not going to back guys down like walonowski would do if one who's way past it of course but that's the style jesus is your prototypical uh david via style false nine moving out moving back in you have to have wings that take advantage of that space so that's where he is. Now, I think he's very motivated by uh, his father's achievements here. He's openly stated that he wants to win a championship here before he moves on to the next phases of his career. I figure maybe a season or two, he's going to give himself that shot on this new contract. It's a pretty nice contract. So you're looking at a typical new coach three-year build. Probably He's probably buying in for that's how I read it based on his comments about his dad and wanting to beat his dad's own achievements here and how much he likes this club. And he's been here since he was nine years old with this organization. So um, I think he will eventually be ambitious about going places. I think we got two seasons probably maybe after this before we see him go off to the great uh, European waters. I think that's big, though. I mean, you know, for a lot of Union fans, you know, especially like the ones that are starting to get into soccer, they don't understand like why it is, you know, we're selling off Brandon Aronson and McKenzie. We think that they would stay here. But, you know, going going forward down in the future, there might be that player that, you know, you know, we, we were trying to sell off and wants to kind of stay. We can be able to sign him to a nice DP contract like you guys have with Jesus Ferreira. So I think that that bodes well uh, for clubs that are building like Dallas and like Philly here. Another player I want to talk about. Let's go back to 2019 a little bit. I remember that year vividly because it was about two young homegrown players. It was Brendan Aronson. It was Paxton Pomoko. I felt like those guys were put in the same conversation every single time. Obviously, we saw Brendan Aronson's career, you know, flourish into what it is. And Paxton, I haven't, I felt like I haven't heard a lot about him, but they were in the same trajectory. And and I I know you talked about a little bit about um, his role in this club when he comes back off injury, but Mm -hmm. you know, what's been going on with Paxton, man? What's, what's the future for him as well? 
Well, he basically lost a year of his career with a uh, injury related to his hip. Um, it's a sort of a bone kind of structural issue. Had to have a pretty serious surgery. Uh, we, he was on a radio show uh, here in town with a friend of mine who does write for my website and is on our podcast. He was on the actual radio show that guy does. And he says, he said flat out, this will be like a knee surgery, like an MCL or an ACL, where a year after I come back, I'll actually be back to my normal form. When I first come back, it'll take another year of play before I'm there. And that's where he is right now. So he he was he basically lost a year. He then came back for a year and was kind of, you know, in some games, not in some games, kind of getting better and better. And then this season is that second year back. And we're now seeing him return to the player that he was before. Now, again, he's a little undersized. And when you have that sort of two and a half, almost three year gap of lack of high level play, it kind of leaves you on the outside looking in. Now, his natural position for me is as a linking eight, a box to box eight. I think that's when he's at his best. They've been using him here lately as the other eight, which we kind of like nobody really plays a 10 anymore. We kind of call it a free eight. It's like a De Bruyne kind of eight, that style. But I think he's ideally suited for the other one. And I think going forward that Leggett will play that free role and Paxson probably will become more of the box to box guy, which is his best position. And in terms of his pure game matching up, and I think if he continues to play the way he is this season, that he'll get back in the national team picture. Uh, he needs to raise his game a little bit more, but we're, we're basically halfway through that, Pat, just past that return to peak form from where he said he was. And we're now finally, about halfway through this year, we finally started seeing him play at the level he was before he got hurt. So uh, that, that's why the, the big gap opened up between here and, Emer and him and Aronson. I don't know if Baxton's ever going to be a European level player. Once you sort of miss that time and now you're moving into your mid twenties, maybe the ship has sailed there a little bit, but he's going to be a servant for this club for a long time. It's so crazy. Like, <laughs> like you talk about like 20, late mid twenties, late thirties, you're starting to get older as players. And like it when, in reality, like you're really freaking young in real life, but that's, that's how yeah. sports works. But <laughs> <laughs> it is how it works. And we all know in soccer that you start, you, you peak, you, you go up until you're 26, 27, then you plateau yeah. 27 to 29. And then in your thirties, your age starts to catch up with you. Listen, the is only 22, but you're that's still great. talking about, in terms, that's not young in international soccer, right? I mean, that's yeah. starting to approach when you should be really starting. And look, he's a great player for us here in Dallas. He has long said that he wants to be an MVP discussion player before he leaves. He really loves this organization. Uh, and we're just now starting to see him get back to that level of conversation. So I'm optimistic about where he's going to go in the next year or two. We talked a lot about these young kids with their love and, and appreciation for this club. I, I, I do... I respect that a lot, Buzz. It's it, that is pretty cool to hear. Yeah, you know, there are some that do and some that don't. The ones that have stuck around are the ones that have felt like they were loved and rewarded, and the organization wants them and they've compensated them. And then there are others that have felt like they weren't quite feeling that love, and they're the ones that have gone off, perhaps maybe earlier than they should. In some cases, that's a whole different discussion. Okay. All right. All right. Let's get to uh, Wednesday's match. What could the potential lineup? I'm assuming four three three would be the formation. What would the lineup yeah. look like? Well, the big the big fulcrum is whether Paxton will be um, back in the lineup or not. Uh, I think that this team will look at Philly as a health check in the sense of, do we really think we're a comp competitor to get into the playoffs and do something this year? Philly is a very, very good team. Dallas knows they're a very, very good team. They're looking at Philly as a team that sets a mark. Are we at that level yet? So they're going to, I think, run out their very best 11, which is – uh, pretty ingrained. This coach runs a shorter bench than any coach I've ever seen. There's only maybe five players that play beyond the starting 11. So you're looking at Velasco, Ferreira, and Ariel up front. The midfield will be um, Legette and Edwin Cerillo. Facundo, Quinon, and Edwin are very, very close as to who starts at the six, but uh, Facundo is hurt, so it'll be Edwin. And then the other spot has not been Paxson until now. That other spot's been Brandon Cervania or seeking and settling, but I think it'll actually be Paxton. So that's the one question mark is who, which of the uh, Brandon Smania is hurt also. So it'll be Seeky or, or Paxton. I think it will actually might see Paxton. So that'll be interesting. And the back line is pretty much locked in stone. Farfan, Jose Martinez, Matt Hedges, uh, Emma Tuomasi at right back and Martin Paz, the big goalkeeper signing in goal. Now you might say, could we see rotation this week with three games in a week for Dallas? But this coach has been using 
days off in training and the five sub rules to heavily rotate his squads and keeping guys on like 60 minutes, like last game at a right about 60 minutes, uh, Jesus pa- Paxton didn't start, but he came in about the 60th minute. Um, Ferreira, Areola, um, Jose Martinez, who's had some, some legs issues lately. Those like main pieces are all coming out of games early all the time, trying to keep them fresh. So uh, I don't think you'll see any rotation. I think you're going to see the best 11. Okay. All right. And uh, I mean, listen, we we kind of have to talk about the weather because that is actually a factor <laughs> down there. What's what's it looking like for Wednesday? I haven't actually looked yet, but what, uh, what's lately, it like today? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look in a little bit. Um, I mean, right right now today, it's uh, let's see how hot is it outside. Uh, it's about ninety nine, like I think. Okay, <laughs> I was like waiting for like hundred and five. Like, yeah, oh. no, it's uh, it's yeah, it's ninety nine. Um, you know, whether what it'll actually get over a hundred today. Um, you know, I think the other day it dropped out. The high was 99 for the first time in like three months. So yeah, it's going to be hot here. It's not as humid as Houston, but it's super hot. You know, it's now the games at eight, night? yeah, well at eight o'clock, it'll probably still be about 96 degrees probably. Right. And the, the surface in, in, uh, even if it drops down to like 92, the surface in, in Toyota stadium is a bowl. So it'll okay. be 10 degrees hotter at least on the field than it will be outside in the air. Water during, breaks, buzz. Water breaks. Yeah, during that the summer. It, too. <laughs> yeah, during the summer, it's about 120 on that field. It's oh nasty. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. All right. So last but not least, Buzz, uh, can we get your prediction? And then we also would like, since this is a union podcast, Buzz, a, a key for the union to beat Dallas. Well, the the key to the union, I think, is the key to all of their games is that is their defense. Their defense is spectacularly good, and if you can keep Dallas out of the net, then you'll have a chance to win here on the road. Um, Dallas is good offensively, but Philadelphia is capable of handling everybody I've seen them play against. I haven't watched every game, mind you, but I've seen a couple of games and they easily handle almost everybody. So if you keep Dallas to zero, keep them on the blank, then you're going to walk out of here with at obviously cliche minimum of a point, but you'll have a legit chance to win because Dallas is not a give up no goals kind of team. They're a give up one goal and lock it down kind of team. So I think it'll go late. Zero zero, and then I think Philly will have a very good chance, probably through uh, is it Bozak, the guy in the midfield? Um, how you pronounce his name? Uh, Gazak, 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 yeah, Gazak, yeah. I've that guy looks to me like in the clips I've seen, the games I've seen, a guy, a gamer, a dude that rises to the occasion. So, like, my gut instinct is gonna be like that's a dude late that will get a chance to win the game here, whether he gets it or not. It's the difference between probably one oh and zero zero. That's where I that's where I'm at. My, so right now the big thing is the front three. Well, we obviously don't run a four three three, but we do the four two three. Or sorry, the four four two diamond. Mm-hmm. Um, but the big thing, and you mentioned it because I'm thinking about it right now with the with the weather inclement. Mikel Uwa, one of the forwards, for us, fitness wise, it's still been a work in progress. He's been playing. He's been playing. Actually, played seventy minutes against um, in our last match. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye out for for sure. But oh, uh, it'll it'll be it'll be fun to watch, man. It, it definitely would. Yeah. Both teams are really good. I, I think I'll speak for for myself. I think walking away with the point, I, I would definitely take that in a midweek match. It good gets a good Dallas team as yeah. well. Man. We're talking. We talk a lot here about if you want to be in the upper echelon in this league, you need players that can step up in the moments that really, really yeah. matter. You need sure. your you need your uh, your uh, Velas, right? You need your 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 guys who historically Chicharito, of course. You you need your uh, Espria. I'm the a killer Columbia. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah. you need the guy who like in that moment so like that's this game for me is that kind of game it's like who's got the guy that oh, has God. the guts deep to be like this is the, one of those moments and get it and and for dallas that's probably ariel or jesus maybe and then for philly you could tell me but i really like the guy in midfield whose name i can't ever remember uh Gadzik or whatever Gadzik. daniel yeah. guys like we we will yeah, Zach, him, yeah that guy i've seen him a cut twice and i was like oh what a player so those are the Scored keys it. for me Scored a goal against England, man. Too. He he's, did, yeah. He's catching some eyes, man. He's catching some eyes. Well, Buzz, listen, I, I really do appreciate you coming on in here, man. But before you go, we want to know where can people find your good work if we're getting a hankering of what's going on in Dallas? Sure. Our me- main website is thirddegree.net. Uh, the podcast is Third Degree the Podcast. I know, solid branding. And then the the Twitter account is uh, Third Degree on Twitter. So that's we use the same name, consistency of branding. I've learned my stuff over the years from watching teams fail. Go. So that's where you can find us. 
Awesome stuff. Thank you so much to Buzz, and uh, we'll we'll talk soon, man. Yeah, pleasure.